hold on to your shimmies because we're gonna get into this one. Before we get into today's video, I just wanna let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week. I hope everybody is doing great and getting geared up for another beautiful, hopefully wonderful weekend. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about a situation that happened not too long ago that is getting ready to go to trial. And when I tell you, for those of y'all that like to watch trial proceedings and see what goes on, this is going to be one for the books. This story is all over the place. I mean, buckle up because we're getting ready to get into it. Before we get into it, though, I did want to let y'all know if y'all don't already know. Hi, my name is Christina Randall. I do have a second channel, which is Casually Christina. We just do things more casually over there. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon is for 18 and up. And over there, we just talk about more personal stuff. We go live over there. And I have a $2 tier for all of the true crime stuff that cannot go onto YouTube due to their terms and policies over here. It goes over on my Patreon under the $2 tier. Just make sure you read the about section and what each section uh, or what each tier offers before you join. For those of y'all that are watching on the television and you can't see the description box, all you got to do is Google Christina Randall Patreon and it'll come right up. I am also on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, Snapchat, and I'm on Like to Know It now. And Like to Know It is where you guys can find all the links to my favorite things that I use, hair, makeup, jewelry, clothing, fingernails, fingernail polish, stuff like that. That's all linked on my Like to Know It. All of those are linked down in the description box if you would like to come and check me out. So, okay, let's talk about this situation with Karen Reed. Before we go into it, I'm going to let y'all know I don't know any of these people. I am going to tell y'all the story from the best of my ability, from the public information that is already out there. Go do your own research, form your own opinions. I'm not a professional because we're going to get into the theories and all of it. So buckle up. Before we go any further, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, Me Undies. You guys, last time I told y'all about my boy shorts for Me Undies, y'all love them and I do not blame you. Listen, the undergarments drawer is like the wild, wild west. I know for me personally, you know, sometimes I have things for when I'm feeling a little bit more let's say adventurous, or sometimes I have things for every day, and I really love my me undies for the days that I need to feel comfortable because me undies absolutely makes the most buttery soft undergarments. And just look how cute these boy shorts are. They are pink with the little bananas on them. And the band on these boy shorts are so comfortable because they do not dig in. They just lay on my side. Me Undies has styles for everyone from all black classics to fun, expressive prints. Plus they come in sizes from extra small to 4XL, assuring comfort in different styles for everybody. But Me Undies isn't just about underwear. You can explore or their lounge collection that features joggers, hoodies, onesies, and more. And Me Undies signature fabric is as soft as a warm hug from your favorite sweater. It's breathable, stretchy, and oh so comfy, making it ideal for all day wear. And if you've been wanting to try Me Undies, now is your chance because now you can get 20% off of your first order plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash Christina Randall. Yes, you can get 20% off of your first order plus free shipping by going to MeUndies.com forward slash Christina Randall. Thanks again, MeUndies. Karen Reed grew up in Blacksburg, Virginia on a quiet cul-de-sac. Now, according to her parents, Karen liked to play piano and she attended mass with her family regularly. In fact, Karen went to a private Catholic school and she did really well. She took advanced placement classes and she was on the honor roll. So she was a good girl. She did really good in school. And after graduating high school, Karen went to Bentley University, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, where she would go on to get her master's degree in finance in 2004. Very smart young woman, and obviously somebody who 
follows through with her goals. However, Karen's life wasn't as perfect as it may sound though. She had some health troubles and Karen was actually diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 25 and she had 10 surgeries in two years for it. I mean, that's a lot. And she went through a lot with the Crohn's disease. Then at 32 years old, Karen was diagnosed with MS, which is multiple sclerosis. Back when Karen was 24 years old, she met a man who was 28 named John O'Keefe. Karen and John dated for a while, but when Karen moved to Dublin, Ireland for work, she and John broke up. This is when Karen's health problems really started. Karen's health problems got so bad, she actually ended up having to have a clomostomy bag and she had temporary blindness. When Karen ended up moving back to Boston, she started working for Fidelity Investments, and this is when she began teaching finance classes at Bentley University, and this is where Karen has worked ever since. One of her coworkers describes Karen as kind and generous, and they said that she was funny. However, according to some police reports, not everyone would consider Karen as kind. Back in April of 2020, Karen called the cops on her 63-year-old neighbors for being too loud while she was trying to teach an online class. According to the police, when they arrived, Karen's neighbors weren't making any noise. And when I heard that, I thought, now nah, I, nah, I, I know what you're doing. You know, you know how it is when you're being all loud and somebody's telling you to be quiet and when the, na when the police come, everything gets quiet, shh. But I don't know, I don't know the neighbors, but nevertheless, when the cops got there, the neighbors weren't making any noise. Then in November of 2020, those same neighbors ended up calling the cops on Karen. Apparently, while the elderly neighbors were like just outside mowing their lawn, their dog had been barking when Karen came over and was allegedly yelling and screaming at them over it. According to the police report, Karen allegedly told them, you just wait and see, you'll be sorry. At this point, Karen didn't answer the door when the cops arrived, so they never got to speak with her about it. And from that, there's never been any further reported incidents since then. But I thought that that was interesting. Like she was, she was really getting into it with her and these 63 year old neighbors. And I wanna know what was those neighbors doing that was so loud she couldn't teach her class? Was they in the backyard partying, drinking, you know, dancing, hooping and hollering at 63? I mean, I've seen it happen. Nevertheless, back to Karen. So Karen had no criminal record at all. Well, at least she didn't until 2022. In August of 2020, during the pandemic, Karen and John reconnected on social media and they started talking about how John had adopted his niece and his nephew and allegedly the niece and nephew's parents had passed away. So Karen and John started officially dating again, which now meant that Karen was also spending a lot of time with John's niece and nephew. John was an officer with the Boston Police Department. Now it is said that John and Karen loved each other very much. Remember earlier we talked about the fact that they dated for a while, they ended up going their separate ways while she moved to Ireland, she's back, now he's got his niece and nephew, they reconnect, there's obviously going to be, you know, a little bit more obstacles, but also a lot more blessings now that he is raising his niece and nephew, but it is said that they loved each other very much, but like most relationships, it wasn't Perfect. On New Year's Eve of 2021, Karen says that John had been drinking and he ended up not coming home until 3 a.m., which left her taking care of his niece and nephew all night that night. Allegedly, this made Karen feel like she was being taken advantage of. So then we fast forward to January of 2022, and this is when things between Karen and John seemingly would get worse. Allegedly, Karen accused John of cheating on her with a friend's sister while they were on vacation in Aruba. It is said that Karen left several angry voicemails on John's phone, and it was so bad that John was actually considering breaking up with her, allegedly. However, although it is said that John was getting ready to break up with her over this, he would never get the chance to. Because 
On January 29th of 2022, at 6 a.m., deputies responded to a 911 call from Karen's friend saying that she and Karen had found 46-year-old John's lifeless body in the yard of a home at 34 Fairview Road. Okay, so we go from the relationship being rekindled. He's raising his niece and nephew. They get into an argument one New Year's Eve. The next New Year's Eve, they still, they're arguing about different things, seemingly, allegedly. Next thing you know, she wakes up and her and her friend find his lifeless body. But now let's back this up to what happened the night leading up to this, okay? So on January 28th, a huge snowstorm was moving into town and everyone was preparing for it, okay? Karen and John actually decided to go to a place called Waterfall Bar and Grill on Washington Street in Canton. It was a Friday night around 11 p.m. and this was the second bar that they stopped at that evening. Now, once they were inside the bar, this is when Karen and John ended up linking up with some of John's friends. John's neighbor, Chris Albert, Brian Albert, who is also part of the Boston Police Department, and Brian's sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe, all of which had been raised together in this smaller town, Canton. In this small town, Canton, it only has like 24,000 people, and it's about 20 miles south of Boston. So they all know each other, all grew up together, and they're just all meeting up before this snowstorm to get some food and drinks, Okay. Now, everyone was drinking and everyone was seemingly enjoying themselves at this point. Now, last call ended up being made at midnight, but Brian, the friend, was not ready for the night to end, though. He ended up inviting everyone to his home to have a beer with his son to celebrate his son's birthday. Now, according to Karen, John wanted to go to Brian's house, but Karen felt too buzzed and she was too tired. So, allegedly, Karen ended up driving John to Brian's and supposedly she dropped him off there. Okay, so she don't want to go over there and hang out with everybody. She drops him off at his friends where they're going to go celebrate for the son's birthday and she goes home. Several hours later, at around 4.30 a.m., Karen said that she woke up, she was on John's couch, and she was by herself. She said that John's niece was asleep upstairs and his nephew was away at a sleepover, but John wasn't there. Karen says that she wanted to call Jennifer, who was Brian's sister-in-law, and she was with them that night at the bar, but she didn't have her phone number. So Karen says that she decided to go upstairs to wake up John's niece, who did have Jennifer's phone number. When Karen called Jennifer, Jennifer said that she had no idea where John was. At this point, Karen just begins to call everybody. She's trying to find out where he is. So she made a few more calls to Chris's wife, Julie, and John's friend, Carrie. However, Karen still could not find John and she did not know where he was. And she said this is when she really started to worry. This is when she ends up going and meeting up with the woman Jennifer and a woman named Carrie, they all met up at Jennifer's home to go and look for John. Now, in the back seat, Karen was panicking. She was screaming that John was missing in the middle of a snowstorm, and it was 18 degrees outside. So she is freaking out, like, where is he? It's a snowstorm. Like, what is he doing? Like, freaking out, okay? So they decided to go to the house that Karen supposedly dropped John off at earlier that evening. 34 Fairview Road. As soon as they were pulling up to the house, Karen yelled that she could see John in the yard, even though it was basically pitch black outside. Karen jumped out of the car and she ran over to John, who was lifeless and covered in snow. Karen immediately started to like clean all of the snow off of him. She started to put her hands on him. She ended up laying on him anything she could to keep him warm. This is when Karen started to give John mouth to mouth and Carrie was like doing CPR on him. It was also said that John had blood coming out of his nose and his mouth and he had a swollen right black eye. I mean, obviously something had happened to him. John's hat and one of his shoes were missing and Jennifer ended up bringing blankets from her car 
while she called 911. Officers quickly arrived, followed by an ambulance that took John to the hospital where he was pronounced deceased at 7.50 a.m. The medical examiner noted several abrasions on John's right arm, two swollen black eyes, a small cut above his right eye, and a cut on the side of his left nose. And he also had like a two inch cut on the back of his head. He had multiple skull fractures that caused brain bleeding and his pancreas indicated hypothermia that contributed to his death. So he was clearly all kinds of beat up and then seemingly froze to death on top of it. The cause of death, however, is listed as undetermined. And this is when a full investigation began. Karen was apparently in consolable. It is said that she laid on her parents' couch for three days straight after what happened. Karen said that she had to get sleeping medication from a doctor and she also found herself a lawyer and the lawyer's name is David Yanetti. State police trooper Michael Proctor, who was in charge of the investigation, came and asked Karen questions, which she answered willingly. The fourth day when Karen went back to her own home, because <clears throat> remember she was laying on her parents' couch for the first three days, when she went back to her own home was the same day that Karen says that she was talking on the phone with a close friend when her home was completely swarmed by police officers. At 7.40 p.m., Karen ended up being arrested for manslaughter. And get this, y'all. In the charging documents were witness statements from Jennifer and Carrie. So these women that were helping her do CPR and all of that, they were on the witness statements that got her arrested. Jennifer said in her witness statement that Karen had told her that she had last seen John at the bar that night before and that her and John had gotten to a fight and also that she didn't remember dropping him off at the house at 34 Fairview, okay? Now, according to Carrie's statement, Carrie said that Karen was so drunk that night that she told Carrie in the morning that she didn't remember anything from the night before, but that she did wonder if John had been run over by a snowplow, like... That's weird, okay? Carrie also said that Karen still seemed drunk that morning when she was out looking for John. And Carrie also added that before her, Karen, and Jennifer found John, that Karen showed them a cracked right taillight saying that she had no idea how it happened the night before, okay? So yeah, it would seem a little strange if all of those things were, were said to these women, right? She didn't remember really where she dropped him off. She thought he might've got run over by a snow plow. She got a cracked tail light. She don't know how it happened. And then all of a sudden they find him in this condition, okay? Also, the charging documents said that an EMT allegedly overheard Karen saying, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. The Canton police found a broken drinking glass and multiple red splatters in the snow near John's body. They also found a piece of plastic, two red pieces, and one clear in the same area as his body was found. They say that those pieces were consistent with Karen's broken taillight. Now, law enforcement impounded Karen's car and did find that it ended up having a broken glass lodged in the rear bumper and a deep scratch and a dent on the right side of the rear tailgate and it had two scratches plus some chip paint on the right side of the rear bumper. This led investigators to believe that in a drunken state, Karen ended up backing up and struck John and then drove off. Then in a brief statement after Karen's arraignment, Karen's lawyer said that Karen was in complete shock that John's death was just an innocent accident. He said that Karen had no criminal intent. Now, this is where things get crazy, okay? Because holy moly, right after Karen's arraignment, as Karen's lawyer was driving home, he returned a call to someone who ended up calling in a tip to his office. A man answered the phone and told Karen's lawyer that Karen was completely innocent. He said that John was beaten up by Brian Albert. 
the homeowner, the other Boston police officer, okay? He said that Brian and his nephew were trained MMA fighters, okay? This person said that the two of them broke John's nose and when John didn't come back to consciousness, Brian and a federal agent that was also at the house that night dumped John's body on the front lawn. The federal agent that was at the house that night is a man named Brian Higgins, who is a special agent with the ATF. This Brian Higgins had a previous romantic relationship with Karen before, okay? We also know that Brian Higgins destroyed a cell phone after John's death. That's weird. Okay, why, why, after all of this and the investigation and being a professional, why would you destroy a cell phone? I don't know. Either way, Karen's lawyer was intrigued by this tip and all of this information. He started to wonder if Karen was being framed. Because of this, Karen's lawyer hired a private investigator. And this is when things get, I'm telling you guys, buckle up y'all, because we're going on a ride, okay? The private investigator didn't learn a whole lot other than the fact that someone confirmed Brian's nephew, a 16-year-old boy named Colin, was indeed at the house the night that John passed away. Now, when Karen's lawyer told her what was going on, Karen started remembering things. Karen says one night, back in the spring of 2020, John's security alarm at his house went off. John ended up jumping up out of bed to see what was going on. Karen says that she followed John downstairs and she remembered seeing Colin, the nephew, and several other teenagers in the front yard. Karen says that she heard Colin tell John, go F yourself, and John yelling back, get the F out of here. Karen says when her and John woke up the next morning, they found a bunch of empty Bud Light beer cans thrown all over their yard. The police were never called, but Karen says from that point forward, John and Colin were never on good terms with each other. Karen even went as far as to saying that Colin is the only person that John ended up having beef with it in that town. When Karen's attorney showed her pictures of John's injuries, Karen immediately became suspicious of the injuries on John's arm. In her opinion, she said that the, these injuries look like they could have been from like an animal or from a dog. Then she remembered that Brian Albert, who was the homeowner, had a German shepherd at the time named Chloe that they have since rehomed. Then during a dinner with a friend, Karen found out that the lead investigator on her case, Michael Proctor, knew the Albert family. Karen started to think to herself like, wouldn't that be a conflict of interest to the investigation. That night, she says that she ended up getting on Facebook and she found a photo taken at Michael's sister's wedding that showed Colin, again the nephew, as their ring bearer. At this point, Karen just, she was 100% convinced that the beef with Colin started a fight that night. The German shepherd, Chloe, got involved and caused the arm injuries. And after the fight was over, they tossed John out into the yard to to, to just die. And not only that, but Karen was now convinced that Michael Proctor, the lead investigator, was pulling strings behind the scenes. Now the prosecutors, on the other hand, were convinced that Karen was indeed the killer, okay? They, they just, that's it. They even got a grand jury involved and it was concluded that there was indeed enough evidence to charge Karen with second degree murder, which meant that it was intentional. Then we fast forward to June 9th and this is when Karen was rearrested for the new charge. In body cam footage from the jail, Karen can be heard asking the officer that's booking her if he's in on the joke too. Today, grand jury indicted you on these charges, second degree murder, uh, legal uh, homicide, and um, leaving the scene of a death. Okay? So those are the charges the grand jury indicted you on. So now you're being charged and will be arranged in Superior Court, Norfolk County Superior Court in Delhi. Okay? So bail doesn't apply anymore? Uh, typically, I, I'm not, so we don't set the bail. But typically, once murder comes into play, people are going to get bailed out. So it's not manslaughter anymore, no. is that the difference? That's correct. It's a higher degree of taking a life. Okay, so those, that's the charges that you're being charged with now. 
and you were indicted by Frazier. Okay, you're aware that he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Alvarez. I mean, we're all in on the same joke, right? My taillight was cracked and John was pulverized. Okay, you you need to uh, abide by the, the the rights that were afforded to you. Okay, so uh, you can you can talk if you want. If you want to talk, tell us what happened, that's fine. We'll listen, but you were ready to do your rights, okay? And, and I'm sure he's going to do it again. However, Karen was able to make bond, and this time she had a $100,000 bond. With this new charge, however, Karen is facing a life sentence, and it was becoming very serious, according to Karen, so she decided to get a famous defense lawyer, Alan Jackson. Now, Alan is known for defending Harvey Weinstein, and Kevin Spacey. This new attorney got right into poking holes in the prosecution's theory. He too did not believe that John's injuries looked like he had been just hit by a car. I mean, to him, it looked more like he had been beaten up and attacked by a dog. And not only that, but he also found out that according to the lead investigator's original affidavit, he said that he got to Karen's parents' house at 4.30 p.m. and towed Karen's car at 5.30 p.m. But Karen's parents' security camera footage actually showed that those times were absolutely wrong. They showed that Karen's car was towed closer to 4.12 p.m. This was over an hour difference. And Karen and her new lawyers, which were the original ones, the ones that, the one that actually started thinking it was suspicious and hired the private investigator, along with her new lawyers, now believe that this like time discrepancy would have given the lead investigator plenty of time alone with her new car to break the tail light even more and plant pieces of it at the home of 34 Fairview before the team that searched the area found them after 5.45 p.m. Now, can you believe that? Then this new attorney says that he found out that Jennifer, okay, remember Jennifer was one of the, the women that was with her, also one of the ones that was on the witness statements that got her arrested, said that this Jennifer allegedly made an incriminating Google search on her phone. Jennifer had turned her phone over to the prosecution voluntarily for forensic download. The download allegedly shows that at 2.27 a.m., the night of John's death, Jennifer Googled house long to die in the cold. So the actual search says house, but it seems like the person was trying to Google how. How long to die in the cold. Pretty freaking weird, right? That was just hours before Karen and Carrie found John in the yard. The same search was allegedly made again at 6.23 a.m. and then again at 6.24 a.m. Yeah. This new attorney also alleges that in security camera footage from John's house, Karen can clearly be seen accidentally backing into John's parked SUV in the driveway the morning of as she's on her way out to Jennifer's house. And he claims that that is where the rear damage on Karen's car came from. And it's crazy when you guys see that because you can clearly see her back up into the SUV and the SUV move because she hit it. I mean, obviously, not super hard, which is why there wasn't a ton of damage to her car. However, the prosecution swears that she didn't hit it and she only came close to hitting it. Now, on April 12th of this year, Karen's lawyer submitted his 91-page affidavit that laid out the defense's theory of what that they believe happened that night. They allege that that chick, Jennifer, planted the idea of running John over in Karen's mind. Like we've already talked about, that John was actually beaten by the people in the house that night, and they also believed that they had planted the pieces of her taillight at the scene of the crime. And when this came out, this is when the media went wild. A blogger that goes by the name online, Turtle Boy, 
has been posting a lot about this and he posted a blog about this case. He says that he knew immediately after going through that affidavit that Karen was innocent and that she was being completely framed. Okay, now there was so much traffic on his website about this that it actually crashed his whole website. He kept writing more and more articles about this case and his followers interest just kept growing. So he started live streaming on YouTube a series called Canton Cover Up. Now, rumors started spreading all throughout this town, which caused a huge divide between residents. It had gotten so intense that the town's police chief released a press statement about it. The harassment of witnesses and the murder prosecution of Karen Reed is absolutely baseless. It should be an outrage to any decent person and it needs to stop. Innuendo is not evidence. False narratives are not evidence. Two weeks later, when Karen showed up to court for her hearing, she could not believe her eyes. There was a crowd outside the courthouse, a crowd of people that were there to support her. And this is what caught my attention. When I saw these people outside chanting, free Karen Reed and holding signs, I was like, what is going on here? Let me dig into this because what in the world? This team will not quit. Never. The good people of this county will not quit. Never. And I can guarantee you, Karen Reed and her family will never, ever quit. Never. Not until the truth comes out. Not until the John O'Keefe's killers are brought to justice. Aiden's coverage continued to grow and grow and grow, but it kind of grew to be controversial at the same time. Some would even say it grew to be hateful. And at one point, Aiden traveled to Canton to specifically confront the people that he says are responsible for John's death. One of those people being none other than that chick we talked about, Jennifer. Aiden went to Jennifer's daughter's high school lacrosse game and asked Jennifer things like, are you worried about what's going to happen to your family when you go to jail? And Aiden live streamed the whole thing and that whole interaction. Allegedly, some of his followers were even messaging Jennifer like all these terrible messages and telling her things like to go end yourself. Aiden even held a rally of more than a hundred people where they passed around markers to write catchphrases on their cars like how's long for justice like the the Google search the HOS right referring to Jennifer's Google search. They drove their cars through the streets of Canton and then to Brian Albert's house, that homeowner, okay? And they drove it to Michael Proctor's house who was the lead investigator and Jennifer's house. At each stop, Aiden shouted things through a blow horn at their homes and other people were honking their horns the whole time. And all of this ended up being live streamed. And all of this was going on while this Aiden slash turtle boy was having his own legal issues. He has since been arrested and indicted on more than 15 felony charges involving witness intimidation and conspiracy. He ended up serving 60 days in jail for violating a protective order, but now he's free on his own like recondence. Like, you guys. This is a this is going on. This event has been really going down in the little town of Canton. Now, while Aiden's reportings have been called controversial, a lot of people have said that regardless, he has been steadfast in his reporting of Karen's case, and there's no way that this case would have gotten the attention that it has gotten without him. So you've got this, you know, this teeter of opinions like like some people are saying, yeah, he's gone overboard. Maybe he shouldn't have done these things. However, if what the defense is saying is true, maybe Karen wouldn't have had a chance without all the attention on the case that's being brought there. That's some people's opinions. Now let's move back to Karen's case, okay? So more recently, the prosecution has been asking the court to give them permission to access Karen's phone to pull all of the data from it. They haven't gotten permission though because it contains privileged communication between Karen and her lawyers. And I wanna say right now that that's, ended up, that's what ended up happening with Johnny Depp, okay? So Johnny Depp turned over 
10 years of his cell phone text messages. Amber Heard turned over none. They combed through 10 years of text messages and could pick out any little thing. And now they wanted Karen Reed's whole entire phone database. And the defense is, is saying like, no, you can't. Because they're texting back and forth about the defense. Then the prosecution can read everything that they're communicating about. Now, there are many, many theories surrounding this case, so let's talk about some of them. Now, of course, there's the defense's theory, which we've already talked about, and while it sounds interesting, not all of it quite adds up. See, John's home security cameras recorded 15 events between 6 p.m. the night that he passed away and 6 a.m., but none of them show Karen coming home that night. However, this footage has allegedly since been lost, which that's a little suspicious, okay? It's a little suspicious. Then there's the interview Colin Albert gave. Colin says that the night of the incident, he was actually walking out of his house at 30 Few Fairview right when Brian was walking in. Colin says that he said hello, got into a car, and then he left. Now, according to court documents, no one else, including John, had showed up to the house yet, and that was around 12, 10 a.m. Then Colin's parents said that once he got home, he was home for the rest of the night that night. Not to mention, nearly everyone else at the house that night testified at the grand jury hearing that John never came inside the house. Also, according to many people in town who knew John and Colin, they say that there was no beef between the two of them. Some even say that that story that Karen told about Colin showing up in John's yard in the middle of the night, cussing him out and leaving all those beer cans, that none of that was even true. It was a different boy, a completely different boy entirely. And as far as Brian's German Shepherd, a source says that Brian rehomed his dog after she got into a fight with another dog. Brian also sold his family home after the incident, a home that had been kept in his family for generations. It is also said that the basement floor was ripped up before it was sold. Then a spokesperson for the DA's office said that the lead investigator's time discrepancy regarding the towing of Karen's car was a simple error that was corrected later in filings. The DA also confirmed that he was never alone with Karen's car and never returned to the home of 34 Fairview after it was towed. You know, like returned to plant that evidence. The prosecution has also since come out and said that they found microscopic pieces of taillight on John's shirt and that they didn't find any traces of taillight in John's driveway or any damage to his car. They would expect to if Karen had in fact backed into John's car as she was leaving the house that morning. Now again, we watch the video. You guys make your own opinion. A jury's going to have to make their opinion on that part as well. As far as Jennifer's Google search, the state's forensic expert says the timestamp of 2.27 a.m., was only because of Jennifer's typing into the search bar of a tab that was opened at 2.27 a.m. and that she left it open. The expert says that this does not prove that the search itself was made at 2.27 a.m. But you gotta admit, that's a really, really weird coinky dink. Okay? Not to mention, Karen had changed her story a few times, okay? So Karen didn't just have the straight story the whole entire time. John's niece, the one that lived with John and the one that Karen woke up to call Jennifer, said to the investigators that in the moment, Karen changed her story multiple times as well. Karen also told the lead investigator that she dropped John off at the house and went home because she wasn't feeling well and said that she never actually saw him go in the house. But during a media interview, Karen said that she saw John go inside and that she waited at least 10 minutes to make sure everything was okay and for her to come inside, but that she never heard from him. So she went ahead and went home. I said, can we make sure we're welcome here? Nobody extended the invite to me. I didn't hear the invite extended to you. So I pull at the foot of the driveway, it's snowing, 
John has no coat on. It's windy. So I drop him off. He goes up the driveway and approaches the side door. And as I see him approach the door, I look down at my phone. Reed says after about 10 minutes of waiting in her car, she became irritated that O'Keefe still hadn't gotten in touch with her. And she drove back to his home where she continued calling him before she says she fell asleep around 1.30 in the morning. Also, Karen has insisted that her and John were completely happy in their relationship but cell phone data shows that Karen called John over 50 times that night and left him several angry voicemails screaming at him, saying that she hated him. It's also important to keep in mind that we don't know all of the evidence that the state has yet. Okay, so we don't know what all we what all they have. We just know what was on the affidavit. Basically, like the same way in the situation with Brian Koberger. We know what was in the rest affidavit. We know all the rumors swirling around, but we don't know everything that the prosecution has against him, and we don't know everything that the prosecution has against Karen. Something else that I think is pretty darn interesting is that the U.S. Attorney's Office is also investigating this case to see if there's any actual law enforcement cover-up going on. Like, whew, if it's going on, y'all better watch y'all's backs because there's more people getting involved now. Now, they will not confirm anything, though. And it is said that they ended up getting a whole separate grand jury together and they ended up calling the same witnesses, but they had a totally separate grand jury, which, why would, I've never heard of them doing this before. Why would they even do this if they weren't even just like a little bit suspicious that something else was going on while they were investigating, okay? Sources even told the media that the FBI interviewed everyone that was at the house that night and at least one witness allegedly said that John was there, that John did go inside and he had been there, even though the majority said that he wasn't. And it's interesting that one said that he was. Now, it has also come out that the state police are investigating the lead investigator, Michael Proctor. They say that they're investigating a potential violation, but Michael remains on full duty the whole time. So he allegedly is under investigation, but he's still working on this case. Now, Karen's trial is supposed to start with jury selection on April 16th. However, by the time you guys watch this, it will be past the 16th. So hopefully the jury is being selected. So jury selection is supposed to start and then the trial is supposed to start. And when I tell y'all that I'm gonna be watching this, I'm gonna be watching this. Have y'all heard about this? Is this not crazy? I t I'll tell y'all right now, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think, but an unbiased jury cannot convict a person if they don't believe something without a reasonable doubt. I say an unbiased jury. Okay, so what do you guys think? Are you going to be watching this? Do you think she did it? Do you think it's a cover-up? What do you think? Y'all let me know in the comment section down below. Other than that, I love you guys. Thank y'all for watching this video, and I will see y'all in the next one. Love you guys. Bye.